Welcome to uh, all of you on this snowy Thursday. This is uh, our weekly MCUBE seminar. Uh, today, we're very happy to have Brandon Walden. Uh, Brandon uh, is from uh, NOAA, NOAA across town. And uh, uh, he had a very, uh, <laughs> very varied path to, to this, uh, to, to this, uh, to this, this uh, juncture. He obtained a BS in oceanography from Hawaii Pacific University in 2007. 2007, 2009, he worked for the National Marine Fisheries uh, Services as an uh, op observer biologist uh, aboard uh, longline tuna and swordfish vessels. Glad you were there. I had, I had swordfish last night, actually, for dinner. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, just coincidence. <laughs> um, in 2010, uh, uh, got a master's degree in applied marine science from the University of Cape Town, uh, South Africa, doing seasonal rainfall forecasting in the Western Cape. Uh, 2017, a PhD at uh, CSU, where his uh, topic was the, the Madden Julian Oscillation. From, uh, in 2018, he, uh, he was a NOAA Climate and Global Change Postdoctoral Fellow here at NOAA. And um, 2020 to present, he's a research scientist at Ceres and affiliated with uh, NOAA PSL. Today he's going to be talking about uh, atmospheric uh, uh, oceanic uh, coupled energy budgets of shallow and deep convective discharge recharge cycles. Brandon. Okay, does this sound all right? You guys can hear me? All right, cool. All right, so um, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. As Rich said, I'm gonna talk about ocean atmosphere coupled energy budgets of shallow and deep convective discharge recharge cycles. Um, and for the sake of time today, I'm just gonna tell part of this story, focusing on the special role that mesoscale convective systems, or MCSs, play in the energetics of the deep convective discharge recharge cycle. This is work done in collaboration with Juliana Diaz, George Colatis, and Maria Gaina from NOAA PSL, as well as Adam Ridbeck from NRL, Faz Ahmed from UCLA, Emily Riley from CSU, Jingchao Chen from Penn State University, and Isabella McCoy from University of Miami. Um, these are super preliminary results. Uh, we haven't started to write this up yet. Uh, this is my first time presenting this outside of NOAA, so, uh, Please be kind, and uh, suggestions, guidance, and advice are both welcomed and appreciated. So I'm not gonna give a whole lot of citations uh, throughout this talk, so I wanna acknowledge right away that this work does build directly on really good work by um, Kunia Nue and Larissa Back and uh, Vijit Methel regarding these discharge recharge cycles. Um, it builds off of Raymond and Company 2009 in terms of gross moist stability. In terms of the ocean atmosphere energy budgets, it's building most directly off of work by Adam Ridbeck and company that came out this year. Uh, and then organizational feedbacks um, off of MAPES and Neil 2011, obviously inspired by, by many, many other papers as well though. So the uh, admittedly vague goal of this work is just to better understand the relationship between clouds and their surrounding thermodynamic environment. Um, obviously, this relationship depends on what scale you're talking about, both spatial and temporal. So today, we're going to be talking about spatial scales, you know, roughly two and a half degrees latitude longitude, so 250 kilometers on a side, something comparable to what you'd see in this photo here. Um, and we're going to be talking about day-to-day -day variations. So we're going to be looking at daily average data. So we're really talking about, most of the time, the relationship between an ensemble or population or collection of clouds and their surrounding large-scale average thermodynamic environment. So a different perspective on this, this is uh, satellite imagery from the Dynamo Field Campaign. This red inset here shows a roughly two and a half degree box. So, you know, large enough to contain a collection of many small uh, convective elements, or if we looked at a different time, we might see this whole box filled by a single MCS. So we need some kind of narrative for what's going on in this photo here, and there are a whole bunch of different narratives. Um, one such narrative is that of large-scale forcings, and by forcings, I mean surface fluxes of heat and moisture, large-scale convergence, radiative cooling, 
these forcings slowly driving the atmosphere towards instability. So surface fluxes of heat and moisture, warming and moistening the near surface, radiative cooling aloft, causing the buildup of instability. And the response of convection to these large scale forcings is to remove this convective instability. So we can imagine this as being two processes which are kind of pushing towards each other. Um, and in terms of data, uh, one way this could look would be if we had some relevant measure of convective instability on the x-axis, and different people have different opinions on what measure is the most relevant, but some measure of convective instability on the x-axis. Precipitation rate on the y-axis, the black solid line shows the bin mean precipitation rate. So we can see when instability is very low, we have very little precipitation. As instability increases uh, and crosses what's often called a critical point or critical threshold, we have this rapid increase in precipitation rate. Um, the dashed line here shows uh, the PDF of this measure of instability, and you'll notice it has this interesting shape with a, a relatively long tail off to the left and dropping off pretty quickly to the right. So we could interpret the shape of this PDF through this uh, lens of large scale forcing and convective responses being the result of this slow drive towards instability by the large scale forcings, and then this rapid drop off in the PDF to the right as a, re um, a result of this rapid removal of buoyancy by convection. Again, both of these processes push pushing towards each other and coming to some sort of semi or quasi or statistical balance or equilibrium here um, where we see the mode of the PDF. This is where the system spends most of its time. Of course, we know that narrative is, is uh, overly simplified. Uh, we know that large scale forcings themselves respond to convection. We can see that in this photo. We can see that uh, these convective towers are having impacts on the radiative heating. Uh, we know that wind variability near their base is going to impact surface fluxes. We know late heat released in these convective towers is going to very rapidly impact the large scale circulation. And perhaps no problem has helped us appreciate this coupling between these large scale what I call sources and sinks uh, and convection more than the problem of convective self-aggregation. So this animation is courtesy of Nathan Arnold from his work with David Randall in 2015. And they ran this really interesting and informative uh, uh, setup where they used a global aquaplanet version of the superparameterized cam. They did it in a non-rotating framework, so we stripped away rotational dynamics. They forced this simulation by constant and homogeneous solar insulation and constant SST boundary forcing. So our kind of large scale forcings uh, at the beginning of this simulation are very homogeneous. Okay? And we can imagine the simulation evolving in a few different ways. One way it could evolve would be these kind of homogeneous large scale forcings drive the slow buildup of instability, convection starts to respond and push back. And these two come to some sort of, of balance in a kind of light drizzly state across the planet. Of course, we know this isn't what happens. The planet very quickly aggregates in these regions of increased total precipitable water shown in the blue shading, um, where we have these very moist regions with very active convection and increased large scale upward motion, reduced rate of cooling. Surrounded by these regions where the atmosphere is very dry, we have lots of large scale subsidence and suppressed convection. So I show this to just highlight a couple of things. Um, first of all, that large scale sources and sinks really evolve in tandem with convection or are, are very closely coupled to convection. And that feedbacks arising from this coupling can result in some pretty extreme behavior sometimes. Uh, in this case here, this is the PDF of total precipitable water at the end of this simulation. And we can see that it's separated into a bimodal distribution where we have uh, this state of very enhanced moisture, very enhanced convection, and this very suppressed convective state where the atmosphere is very dry. And in both cases, we have some sort of uh, semi or quasi or statistical balance going on between our large scale source and sink terms and convection in both of, of these regions here. Now, in the real world, we've come to appreciate that these type of feedbacks um, between the large scale source and sink terms and convection um, give rise to the cyclical amplification and decay of convection in the tropics. Um, these have been termed discharge recharge cycles, and they're estimated to have time scales of somewhere between 10 and 40 days. So this is quite poorly constrained. 
Um, this work here is from Kunia Nue and Larissa back in 2017, and they kind of view these discharge recharge cycles through the lens of gross moist stability. And if you're not familiar with that, I'm gonna try to explain this in a much more physical way later on, but just very briefly, this gross moist stability is just a measure of moist static energy export by atmospheric motions or the circulation, um, normalized by some unit intensity of convection. So in these figures here, the y-axis shows moist static energy export or import by atmospheric motions. Um, x-axis shows some measure of the intensity of convection. Um, and the top panel here is showing the probability of increasing precipitation in an observational precipitation product. Basically what they showed is once moist static energy export or import passes some kind of critical value, you will tend to get the amplification or decay of convection. And they looked at the temporal derivatives of these fields, the temporal evolution of this, and showed that it evolved in some cyclical fashion here. And again, I'm gonna to try to describe this more physically as we go. Um, but really the goals of this work are to kind of dig a little bit deeper into what's going on here and specifically look at the cloud population. Can we characterize the cloud population well? Um, and then look at what's going on from an energetics perspective considering both the atmosphere and the ocean. So we wanna consider these feedbacks between convection and these large scale source and sink terms. Um, but we also know that the real world is much more complicated than a non-rotating aqua planet. Um, and it's probably fair to consider some variations in those large scale source and sink terms, variations in surface fluxes or convergence to be more forcing like in nature. So I've got some examples on the right hand side here. And none of these are black and white. This all kind of falls in some grayscale, but you can imagine the initial arrival of an oceanic Kelvin wave or Rosby wave impacting surface fluxes as something that might be a little bit more forcing like in nature. So what we're gonna try to do is really understand this nuanced dance between convection and our large scale source and sink terms. They're constantly pushing and pulling on each other and sometimes finding these, these states of balance. But we also have to appreciate this is going on within the tropics where there's all sorts of other dynamics and interactions with the extra tropics. Um, so this nuanced dance is often gonna be impacted by other foreseen like processes that we're gonna have to sift through. So kind of big picture roadmap for today's presentation. Again, we wanna understand the relationship between clouds and the thermodynamic environment. So we're gonna start by considering two measures of the thermodynamic environment, two measures of convective instability. First, column moisture, a very simple measure of it. And then next, a slightly more nuanced measure uh, in training plume cape. We're gonna use this more nuanced or sophisticated measure to identify our convective discharge recharge cycles. And once we've identified them, then we're gonna use a variety of observational data sets to characterize the cloud population of these discharge recharge cycles. Um, if we have enough time, we'll look at what column moisture can teach us in terms of simplified conceptual models. Um, but we're gonna really have to go back to this simple measure here um, in order to understand these uh, discharge recharge cycles from an energetics perspective. And so we'll consider these ocean atmosphere energy budgets last. Um, all of the analyses I'm gonna talk about today are limited to the Indian Ocean and Western Pacific. We're gonna be talking oceans only, land points excluded. We're using daily average two and a half degree data. Uh, and we're gonna be looking at iMERGE precipitation and ERA-5 thermodynamics for the period of 2001 to 2015, um, or whatever available subset of those years is available for the cloud data. So let's start by looking at these two measures of convective instability. We'll start with column moisture. So as a convective plume or thermal, Rises, we know that it mixes with and entrains uh, air from the surrounding environment. Uh, if this air is subsaturated, it's gonna evaporate cloud water. That evaporation will cause cooling and that cooling will do reduce the buoyancy of that updraft. So entrainment of subsaturated air reduces updraft buoyancy. Many observational and modeling studies have shown that the impacts of this uh, entrainment are most notable in the lower free troposphere, but even still, just column measures of moisture do capture this relationship quite well. Uh, this is a, a relationship that was popularized by Bretherton et al. 2004 and has been used very widely ever since. We've got column saturation fraction or column relative humidity on the x-axis. Y-axis is precipitation rate on a linear scale. Um, we can see that precipitation is a strong increasing function of column saturation fraction. So this relationship is used in, in many simple models. Now, 
looking at this with a linear Y scale gives us kind of a skewed perspective um, of this data here because we know that you know, roughly two thirds of our observations in the tropics happen at one millimeter per day or less. So this is really kind of a skewed perspective looking at more convecting states. So if we put this on a uh, log scale, and this is what we're gonna do for the rest of the presentation, um, you know, we can see that this relationship between column saturation fraction and precipitation rate holds uh, fairly consistently across this whole range of CSF here. So our second measure, um, which is a little bit more sophisticated, is uh, in training plume lower tropospheric cape. Um, and I'll describe this calculation in detail in a second, but basically what we're trying to do is model um, what I'll term a wannabe deep convective plume that is both initiated in and rises through a unrealistically homogeneous environment with large scale average thermodynamic properties. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on some integrated measure of buoyancy in training CAPE. And we're only gonna focus on this measure of buoyancy below the freezing level. So we're gonna be looking 1,000 hectopascals to 600 hectopascals. And we've got a few reasons for doing that. Um, a lot of studies have shown that if uh, plumes or thermals can maintain buoyancy through the freezing level, they have a good chance of being, becoming strong deep convection that, that goes all the way to the tropopause. Lapse rates decrease slightly above the freezing level. You get an extra boost from the late heat of freezing. Um, also, by restricting this to below the freezing level, uh, we get to avoid making a whole bunch of assumptions related to the microphysics and precipitation loading and things that might not be so well constrained in here. So what we're gonna do is we're going to initiate a parcel at 1,000 hectopascals. Um, you can think about this like parcel calculations you would have done in grad school. You initialize this at 1,000 hectopascals, so in the subcloud layer. Um, using large scale average, daily average, two and a half degree average, temperature and moisture profiles. So we're ignoring all of the really important subgrid scale variability that we know exists. Yeah. Uh, and then we are going to uh, raise this parcel up and as we do so, we're going to allow it to entrain air from its surrounding environment and we're going to assume that that air also has these large scale daily average thermodynamic properties Again, ignoring the subgrid scale variability. Um, we as users get to define the entrainment profile and we're gonna do two different profiles. The first one is actually gonna be a no entrainment profile. So we're just gonna raise this parcel up. We're not gonna let it mix with its environment. Uh, and the second one is termed a deep inflow B entrainment profile. Um, and basically this is just a profile which assumes that you're having some mixing over a very deep layer of the lower troposphere. It's somewhat comparable to a uh, if your convective plume had a maximum vertical velocity near 450 hectopascals and you had entrainment occurring below that level and detrainment occurring above that level. And what, uh, what this outputs is virtual temperature profiles. So we can then compare the virtual temperature profile of our plume to the virtual temperature of the environment. We get some estimation of buoyancy, which we can integrate in the vertical from 1,000 to 600 hectopascals and get some measure of, of Capersin. So this example on the right that I'm using um, is just using the array averaged um, thermodynamic profiles from the Dynamo field campaign. I just chose the first day. It's just an example, nothing special. Um, and uh, the black line here is showing the array average, this would be like the large scale environment here, the array averaged virtual temperature. The dashed line here is showing the plume virtual temperature when we assume no entrainment. We can see that it lies to the right of the environment, it's warmer than that, so it's gonna have some positive buoyancy or positive cape. And the black dotted line shows the virtual temperature of the plume when we assume this deep inflow mixing. We can see it lies to the left of or is less than the environment, so it, it's negatively buoyant. It's some negative caper or sin, right? Now what's interesting is we can come up with some uh, estimate of the impacts of entrainment by just looking at the difference between these two here. So if we take our deep inflow B cape and we subtract from it the non-entraining cape, we get some estimate of the impacts of entrainment, uh, which we'll just term cape modification here. So we've done a whole bunch of work to come up with this more you know, sophisticated measure or slightly more sophisticated measure of convective instability. How does it compare to our very simple measure of column moisture, CSF? So we've got column saturation fraction on the left, cape on the right, a linear precipitation Y scale on the top, a log precipitation Y scale on the bottom. 
And you can see that, you know, despite this additional sophistication, uh, CAPE remains very closely related to CSF via entrainment. They've got these kind of similar bulk relationships to precipitation. Obviously, the PDFs have a different shape. Um, and we have a whole bunch extra information buried in this CAPE one here. But the, the general bulk relationship is, is actually quite similar here. So why are we concerning ourselves with two different measures? Well, they each have very different benefits and limitations. Column moisture is much better observed. Uh, microwave and infrared sounders do a pretty good job of, of constraining column water vapor variability on large scales. So it's going to have fewer systematic errors in reanalysis. It's a rel relatively simple and understandable measure. Uh, and very importantly, it permits budget analysis. Um, and because of these characteristics, it's been used in you know, 50 plus years of theoretical and simplified model development that we can learn from and, and build on. Um, its limitations are that it largely ignores temperature variability uh, and doesn't really consider vertical structure. Uh, our entraining cape obviously incorporates temperature variability and incorporates vertical structure of moisture and temperature. Um, but it's much more poorly observed. We don't have good measurements of moisture variability in the boundary layer. This means we're going to have more systematic errors in reanalysis. We have to be more skeptical of our results. Um, it's relatively complex. It's not so amenable to budget analyses. Um, and it's of limited utility in simplified models. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to use the benefits of each of these. We're going to use in training CAPE to identify our discharge recharge cycles. And then we're going to use column moisture to understand them from an energetics perspective. All right, so uh, let's now identify our discharge recharge cycles. So we've got this bulk relationship. And what we're really interested in is the relationship between CAPE and precipitation rates, right? Um, so we're going to dig further into this relationship by considering their joint PDF or their joint distribution, which looks like this. So um, the color shading shows the percent of samples in each bin on a log scale. So most of our samples are up here. Fewer samples as we go towards the periphery. We have a single mode, roughly 10 millimeters per day, negative 100 joules per kilogram. Um, and we have this very wide range of precipitating states for most fixed CAPE values, which means that you've got a whole bunch of variability around this generic relationship, which we see here, right? So we want to understand that variability a little bit more. And specifically, we want to understand, we're asking about coupling, right? So we want to know how these two fields, CAPE and precipitation rate, co-evolve in time. So what we're going to do is we're just going to separate our data into bins. Um, and then in each bin, we're going to look at the bin mean temporal tendency of each of these two fields. And we're going to plot that temporal tendency as a vector with the vector tail at the bin center. So the vectors showing in this plot are showing the temporal co-evolution of these two fields, right? how these two fields co-evolve in time. And you can see there are two general regions of cyclical behavior. You've got a clockwise cyclical motion happening down here in the lower left, and you've got a counterclockwise cyclical motion happening up here. We're working on a log scale, so the y aspect of these vectors is quite exaggerated down low and quite compressed up high. But I'll try to show you a few other plots to convince you we indeed have two different cycles that are, that are overlapping here. So what's important about this result is by using this more sophisticated measure of CAPE, um, we've identified these two overlapping discharge recharge cycles. And previous studies based on column moisture have really only identified a single discharge recharge cycle which has been focused on this one here, which I'll refer to as the deep convective one. So to just further convince you we do have two cycles, you can look in these bins, and you can look at the probability of some field increasing or decreasing in these bins. So on the left-hand side here, I'm showing the probability of increasing precipitation rate in these bins. So warm colors are where uh, precipitation rate tends to increase. We can see we've got one region here and one region here where that tends to happen. Blue colors show where the precipitation rate tends to decrease. The center one is uh, probability of increasing CAPE. Again, we've got two regions where they tend to increase, one region where it tends to decrease. And the far right is probability of increasing column saturation fraction. Um, so we've got these two different couplets here. And now what we're going to try to do is understand what's going on with the cloud population in each of these. 
So we've, we've looked at four different data sets. Today, for the sake of time, we're just going to look at two of them. I think the, first, the, the second one's the more interesting, so please you know, stick with me here. Um, but the first data set we're going to look at is really aimed at characterizing deep convective mesoscale organization. We know that deep convective clouds in close proximity can aggregate into mesoscale convective systems. And we know that these are really important because they induce circulations on scales larger than and persist longer than the individual up and down drafts themselves. We also expect these to be very important from an energy budget perspective for a handful of reasons. Um, first, both convective scale and mesoscale downdrafts are going to transport low moist static energy air downwards. So on the left, I've just kind of schematically drawn the, the climatological moist static energy profile in the tropics. High moist static energy near the surface in the tropopause, a minimum, somewhere roughly around the freezing level, right? Um, and with MCSs, we often see this organized mesoscale inflow around this level here near our moist static energy minimum, which is going to transport this low moist static energy air downwards. Uh, we also know that cold pools of MCSs enhance surface fluxes, estimated to be between 10 and 30 percent enhancement over the Pacific. Um, so, uh, and we know that by definition, MCSs are vast, they're, they're expansive, you know, 40,000 kilometers squared, roughly two degrees by two degrees or, or larger. Um, and uh, we, they have these large stratiform anvils which are going to greatly impact short wave and long wave radiative heating. So from an energy budget perspective, we expect these to be some major players. So we're going to look at this data set from Jia Feng um, that came out last year. It's an MCS tracking uh, data set where they basically com combine a satellite brightness temperature data set with iMERGE precipitation. Uh, apply some criteria about the size of the cold cloud system and certain characteristics of the precipitation, which I'm not going to go into for the sake of time. And they take the iMERGE precipitation and they classify it as being either MCS or non-MCS deep or non-MCS non-deep. And so the hand wavy description is basically MCS precipitation is just deep, large, and long-lived. Um, it's got to have a cold cloud system greater than 40,000 kilometers squared for at least four continuous hours. Uh, deep non-MCS uh, is deep in terms of brightness temperature, but is not large or long-lived enough to meet the MCS criteria. And non-deep is, is just that, doesn't meet the brightness temperature criteria. So looking at these various components in this space, the color shading is showing the fraction of the total precipitation rate that comes from each of these three components. So if we add up these three plots, we get 100% of the total precip rate, which is shown on the y-axis here. So we see when precipitation rates are low, we have mostly non-deep precipitation. Makes sense. As precipitation rates increase, we see more non-MCS deep uh, precipitation. And then up here in the upper right, at precipitation rates greater than roughly 10 millimeters per day, we're seeing this is coming predominantly from MCSs. So when I talk about MCSs, I want you to think about and kind of look at the upper right-hand corner of this figure here. So what this tells us is that that deep convective discharge recharge cycle is associated with changes in mesoscale organization. And we would expect, again, large impacts on radiation surface fluxes and moist static energy transports to be happening right there. So our second data set we're going to look at um, is this wonderful data set um, by Emily Riley, Stefan Tulik, and Brian Mapes from 2011. They looked at CloudSat. This is a cloud profiling radar, so it's going to be better at detecting small cloud liquid and ice particles um, than a precipitation radar. Uh, they defined echo objects as continuous, uh, contiguous regions uh, uh, that were cloudy. In each echo object, they assigned a cloud type based on the echo object's base the echo object's top, and the echo object's width. Okay? So here in the upper left, I'm showing a PDF of the echo objects separated by their base height on the x-axis and the echo object top height on the y-axis. And we can see that these naturally separate into different cloud types when we look at it like this. And so I'm going to walk you through each one of these one at a time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show little samples of these cloud type echo objects. The x-axis is roughly 500 kilometers to give you some measure of scale. We're going to start with our shallow clouds. So cumulus are defined as just having tops less than the freezing level and being relatively narrow in width, less than 10 kilometers. 
Another shallow type is stratocumulus, which are simply, you know, wider than 10 kilometers at that same height. Going to our mid-level clouds, we've got congestus. So these start near the surface, and they top out somewhere between 4.5 and, and 10 kilometers where water freezes homogeneously. And then we've got altostratus and altocumulus. These start higher up. They have bases greater than 3 kilometers, but again, top out between 4.5 and, and 10 kilometers. And then we've got our deep clouds. So we've got narrow deep precipitation, starts near the surface, goes above 10 kilometers, less than 200 kilometers wide. We've got wide deep precipitation, greater than 200 kilometers wide. And then we've got detached anvil. So this, uh, the base is above three kilometers, the top is above 10 kilometers. And then, so this is a relatively thick one. And then cirrus, relatively thin, their bases are above seven kilometers and their tops are above 10 kilometers. So we're gonna look at each one of these cloud types and see where they lay in that, that space that we were looking at earlier here. So what I'm showing in the color shading is the percent composition of the echo objects in each bin. And basically just what I want you to note from this slide is that each one of these cloud types has its own little specific area of this space where they tend to light up. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through both the deep convective and the shallow convective discharge recharge cycles and we're just gonna characterize the evolution of the cloud population. So we'll start with the deep convective cycle here. So we're gonna start in the lower right-hand side of these figures and we're gonna trace this kind of counterclockwise cycle around here. So we start with shallow cumulus, we move towards congestus, we see more narrow deep precipitating, then we see more wide deep precipitating, which we know to be MCSs from looking at our previous data set. And then we see some combination of detached anvil or altostratus, altocumulus, and then back to shallow cumulus. Um, if you study deep convection in the tropics, this is a very familiar cycle to you. You see this in equatorial waves and things like the MJO. The schematic in the lower right um, from Benedict and Randall, um, 2007, shows the schematic of the MJO, and you can see this, this transition from shallow cumulus to congestus to narrow deep to wide deep to detached anvil and, and back to shallow. So we're quite familiar with this cycle. Um, now the shallow convective discharge recharge cycle um, is something that I'm personally a lot less familiar with. Um, starting in this lower left-hand side of these figures and tracing a clockwise circle, we see a transition from shallow cumulus, interestingly mixed in with a lot of high-level cirrus, um, to more stratocumulus here, mixed in with some other cloud types, and then back to shallow cumulus. So we're still digging into exactly um, what this is, but it kind of rings the bell with something you'd see more in the mid-latitudes, which is, you know, uh, stratocumulus transitions or, or cumulus coupling. So um, for now, I'm just going to focus on the deep convective cycle, but um, would love to talk with anybody afterwards about this further. Okay. So, yeah, actually for the sake of time, we're gonna kind of skip past this conceptual uh, model aspect. And we're just gonna go to focusing on the energy budget, but I'll talk a little bit about what this stuff teaches us here. So we can make two assumptions in the tropics, which are fairly reasonable assumptions. We can assume weak temperature gradient balance, um, and, which holds fairly well above the boundary layer. Uh, and we can assume that precipitation variability is to first order driven by moisture variability. Obviously, there are scenarios where each of these assumptions uh, are not well-founded. But if we make these two assumptions, um, through our, our budgets, we're able to link precipitation variability here to our moist static energy budget. And this is important because it gives us a chance at a process level to understand how various processes are impacting precipitation variability. But it's, it's a good thing to ask, are these reasonable assumptions? So one way to, to test this is just to look at, compare um, our probability of increasing precipitation here, which is shown in the color shading, to our moist static energy tendency. And regions where these agree um, suggest that the moist static energy budget might have something to teach us about the processes driving precipitation variability. And regions where they disagree, and there are some regions where they disagree for sure, um, suggest we're going to have to use tools other than moist static energy budget to understand what's going on here. So I'm going to introduce our moist static energy budget here, our, our moist static energy tendency. 
is the result of horizontal and vertical advection, which I'll just refer to collectively as transport terms. These are just atmospheric motions. Um, we have surface fluxes, surface uh, fluxes of moisture and surface sensible heat flux, which I'll just collectively call surface fluxes. And then we've got radiation here. And what I've done in the budget is I've removed the mean and the seasonal cycle. So we're looking at kind of day-to-day -day variations relative to the background of these processes. And before we you know, really spend too much time thinking about any one of these in particular, I really just want to highlight that our surface fluxes here are clearly first order terms in this budget, which tell us that the ocean is acting as a very important energy source and energy sink, so we need to consider that. So we're going to take a little diversion here, and we're just going to look at the ocean. So in the color shading, what I am showing is the SST tendency in the top. Blue colors are, are cooling sea surface temperature. Saturated colors are roughly 0.1 Kelvin per day. Warm colors are regions where the sea surface temperature is increasing. And then we're looking at ocean heat content over different layers of the upper ocean, 0 to 10 meters, 0 to 50 meters, 50 to 100 meters, and 350 to 400 meters. So we can see that the majority of variability in the ocean heat content is trapped in this kind of upper 50 meters here. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on this upper ocean 0 to 50 meter ocean heat content budget. Now when we put this side by side with our atmospheric moist static energy budget, we'll notice something really nice happens. So we've got our, our ocean heat content budget where the tendency is again the result of transport terms. So these are just oceanic motions. Surface fluxes, which we see in our atmospheric moist static energy budget, and radiation terms, uh, some of which are shared with our atmospheric moist static energy budget. So when we add these two together, we get an ocean atmosphere energy budget that is actually more simplified than either one of them, respectively. Our surface fluxes completely drop out, and our radiation term is simplified to just net radiation, net shortwave and longwave at the top of the column at 100 hectopascals, and then penetrative shortwave through the bottom through 50 meters, which is, is negligible. Okay. So now we've got our entire kind of budget laid out here. And instead of trying to figure out exactly what's going on with everything here, um, we're just going to tell one story today. And that is, how do MCSs impact ocean and atmosphere energy budgets? So again. MCSs are this kind of section in the upper right-hand side here. And we're going to start by looking at our atmospheric moist static energy budget here on the left. So what can we say? Well, we can say that um, atmospheric transport terms are expo exporting a ton of moist static energy, just like we thought with that mid-level inflow at the minimum of moist static energy. So atmospheric motions are exporting a ton of energy. But this export is being supported by two different feedbacks, a radiative feedback. This is just reduced long wave cooling to space. Uh, and surface flux feedbacks, transfer of energy from the ocean to the atmosphere. And these feedbacks are strong enough that um, despite this large uh, atmospheric export of moist static energy, the total tendency is actually pretty close to zero. So from the perspective of the atmosphere, this looks like a pretty sustainable situation. Um, but then when we start to look at our upper ocean heat content budget, we look at the tendency here, we can see that the upper ocean is losing energy very rapidly. And that is the result of radiation. In this case, this is reduced incoming shortwave radiation um, because of those extensive anvils. And these surface flux terms, again, which are just transferring energy from the ocean to the atmosphere. So when we consider the two in the combined budget, we can see that the atmospheric export of moist static energy, which shows up in both of them, is clearly not a sustainable situation. Looking at the tendency in the upper right, the column as a whole is very rapidly losing energy. Um, so with the little bit of time I have left here, I just want to give you guys kind of an anecdotal case study example of this, which I've been looking at, um, which uh, hopefully will just give you a little bit more of intuitive feel for this kind of stuff. So, we're going to look at the dynamics of the Manjulian Oscillation um, field campaign that happened October 1st to December 31st in 2011. And we're going to focus on the northern sounding array here. It's roughly a 7.5 by 7.5 degree box, so a little bit larger than the scales we were talking about before. We're going to use the quality controlled version 
of array average variables, which were produced by um, Dick Johnson and Paul Soselski at Colorado State University. Um, and just as a reminder, there is a whole bunch of complex kind of multi-scale variability going on. This imagery is, is essentially the northern sounding array. And I've just chosen two, two days. This is a relatively suppressed convective day. And this is a relatively enhanced convective day, just as a reminder that there's a lot of stuff going on here, which we sometimes forget when we look at kind of array averaged running mean time series of things like precipitation rates. So this is northern sounding array precipitation with a 10 day running mean applied. And you can see we've got these nice three consecutive periods of enhanced convection separated by these periods of suppressed convection. If we look at that time series um, where we have not applied that 10 day running mean, so we just look at daily mean precipitation, uh, we can see that there is considerable day-to-day -day variability over that domain. So if we plot these three events in this phase space here, with each event starting as these kind of white colors, which I guess are kind of poorly chosen for this presentation, and, and move more towards these saturated colors, I kind of walk you through these one at a time. So in this first event, we're starting in this kind of region here near the deep convective cycle. We bounce down, we work our way up, and then it spends a lot of time kind of bouncing around here near this deep convective attractor. At the end, we end up back down here, which is where we start our second event, which works its way back up here, spends a lot of time around here, works its way back down. And then event three, again, works its way up towards this kind of deep convective attractor here. But then something really interesting happens. We see this big transition to this very negative Cape regime here. Okay. So when I first saw this, I thought, boy, I wish that the field campaign wouldn't have ended right then. So I took some ERA-5 data um, and iMERGE data and averaged it over the array, compared it to the CSU data, made sure that it compared reasonably well, and then I just extended this time series by an additional month. And we see that after it made this big transition over to here, we ended up with like relatively suppressed conditions for that entire month and the system stayed over in this kind of shallow convective discharge recharge cycle on that side. So, um, you know, I've got a whole bunch of questions that, that arise from this. You know, did this significant discharge event contribute to these persistent shallow uh, convective regime? Um, it's also nice because then we can attach some imagery to this. So in the upper right on December 21st, um, that's where we expected to see enhanced MCS activity. This is the imagery from that day. December 28th, where we expect to see predominantly shallow cumulus. It's this day. And December 31st, where we expected to see more stratocumulus. That's that day. So this is kind of a purely anecdotal example. And there's obviously large scale dynamics tied into all of this. Um, uh, but I'll just play one more animation here just to give you a little bit more of an intuitive feel for how much <laughs> bouncing around goes, goes on with this. But, So in summary, we have used the slightly more sophisticated measure of convective instability to identify shallow convective and deep convective discharge recharge cycles. Uh, we have used some data sets to characterize both the structure and the organization of the clouds associated with these discharge recharge cycles. Um, and then we have combined ocean and atmospheric energy budgets to examine the energetics of these cycles. Why might this potentially be relevant? Well, um, I hope it'll help us better understand how energy flows into, out of, and between the atmosphere and the ocean systems. Um, and diagnostically, being at NOAA, I'm hoping this will help us assess energy transports within ocean atmosphere coupled weather and climate models. Um, the, these diagnostics take really simple inputs. You just need moisture and temperature profiles with reasonable vertical resolution and precipitation. So um, we hope to apply these diagnostics to some of the new coupled models coming out. Um, hopefully it'll help us better understand the shallow and deep convective, um, how shallow and deep convective organization itself impacts energy transports. Um, and then from a predictability standpoint, um, I'm interested if this has any implications for predictability of primary versus successive MG MJO events, um, and whether or not the ocean atmosphere system tends to get stuck in one of these cycles or basins for extended periods of time. So um, with that, I'll just say uh, 
Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today and, and happy to answer any questions you guys might have. Time for questions, comments? This may be a naive question, but I was found it curious that the, the maximum of your PDF for precipitation is where there's still negative K. Mm -hmm. um, how does that come about? I think it's important to remember that the measure of CAPE that we're using here, using this kind of idealized plume model, that we're feeding large scale average values of temperature and moisture in there. And you can imagine in a two and a half degree by two and a half degree area, um, especially in, in a daily average, that in very important subgrid scale variability that I'm talking about. You know, as the large scale average approaches, goes from negative values as it approaches zero, there's all sorts of elements within that larger array which are going to exceed that value and become positively buoyant. So it'd be a very extreme case if that large scale average ever went above zero because it'd mean your entire domain on a daily average would be unstable, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Falco. Hey, Brian. Um, you know, first of all, thanks for the great presentation. And so you're the fourth person in a, or yeah, the fourth talk in this tropical meteorology installment. And I'm just blown away by how different each talk was. So tropical meteorology is just, it, 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 it has so many facets. Um, now um, to my question, uh, in the beginning of your talk, you said uh, you're only looking at the Indian Ocean and the Westpac. Yeah. So why is that? Why yeah. does this Great not question. maybe not work over the Atlantic or Eastern Pacific? Why, yeah. why is that? Yeah, a couple of reasons. Um, so the Indian Ocean and Westpac generally behave relatively similar to each other when compared to places like the Central Pack or the East Pack. The Central Pacific has a much more kind of bottom heavy vertical motion profile. And, and basically, you need to consider these regimes differently from each other because of the, the large scale context that they're in. So you've got to pick and choose between one of the two. And the West Pack is, is better in our sense because it offers these like long term sounding stations in the West Pack, where if we do want to compare to observations, or we want to look at field campaign data, the West Pack wins out in that sense, we just have better true observations. So when we transition from looking at reanalysis, to trying to, to look at, at more directly observed quantities, the Westpac wins out. This behavior in general, um, people in the past, Cooney's looked at this you know, seven years ago. He did comparisons between the Westpac and the Central Pack. And you do see these convective discharge recharge cycles in both areas. And superficially, if you just look at the diagrams with the vectors, for example, they'll look very identical. But when you start to dig into the individual budget terms and the feedbacks that are going on, they're going to be different at that level. So, so it's good to consider them independently, even though superficially they do look quite similar. Other questions, comments? So those three episodes you looked at had about the same time scale from start to finish. Is that common? Is that the common? Well, yeah, I mean, I think those were all, you know, um, some people would, would say that maybe one of those wasn't quite such a clean MJO event, but they're all you know, MJO events and had kind of associated large scale dynamics. The second event, I believe it was, yeah. was more of a double Kelvin wave type event. Um, but you know, in general, and, and I don't want to necessarily way. draw a direct line from these discharge recharge cycles to these events, because there's obviously large scale dynamics coupled to all of this. But those two are really impossible to to detangle from each other, right? So there are aspects in, in these convective discharge recharge cycles, which I think are inherent to all of these type of variability that we consider, but all of these type, different type of variability have something unique that they bring to the table in, in modifying that kind of generic relationship that we see. Okay, maybe any guesses why, why they're both, they're all about a month, right? start to finish. Yeah, I, I mean, I would assume that probably just comes down to whatever model of the MJO you uh, ascribe to that, that gives it a specific time scale. So I, we have I, a question I would favor on, uh, one versus the other. We have a, uh, a question on Slido from Rosimar. Mm -hmm. 
Nice talk, Brandon. I have some vague memory about the charge discharge argument being used to explain Kelvin wave variability yeah. and specifically Kelvin wave initiation. Have you looked at how the charge discharge cycles vary according to the presence or lack of equatorial waves? Yeah, good question. I, I haven't looked at that yet. And, and to use the terms discharge recharge is, is pretty loaded historically because oftentimes this was thought of in just the perspective of, of the atmosphere. So something like the MJO, for example, you could, you could view as uh, being a recharge and discharge of moisture. But that viewpoint doesn't really work that well necessarily for that if you, if you look at it purely in terms of just moisture because you know, uh, at the most moist point of, of an MJO event, the column integrated moisture anomaly could be precipitated out in less than a day by the enhanced precipitation in the absence of all of these different feedbacks. So that's kind of the two different viewpoints there. Um, but yeah, in terms of how these different equatorial waves can, can interact with these cycles, we haven't looked at it. It'll be something that we'll, we'll want to dig into further for sure. OK. Um, any others? No. Hi again, Brandon. Um, I was curious, like this discharge recharge cycle, is it dip, like scale dependent? Uh, whether you go from MJO to a meso scale, it's like huge wide scale, and yeah. do you see some scale dependence? There? Yeah, it's. I think you know, like I said earlier on, I think the 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 time scale, which a few studies have pegged somewhere between ten and forty days, um, the time scale you come up with really depends on the time scale of the data you're looking at. Um, and I've looked at this relationship on data spanning hourly time scales and like quarter degree resolution all the way up through these daily average two and a half degree resolution and the same kind of cycle pops out of all of that. So there's some kind of self-similar aspect to the processes going on here. And um, there are some reasons like say um, the, the work coming out of David Nealon's group would argue that that in that first slide that I showed with this kind of distinct critical point, when you look at a linear scale, you know, from a dynamic system perspective, that would be termed a slow drive, fast dissipation system with a critical point attractor. And dynamical systems theory tells us that those type of systems tend to have self-similar behavior. So there are reasons that you might expect that. Now, when you look at that on a log scale, the idea of that critical point doesn't necessarily fall out as well in my mind, but David Nealon and his group have done a really good job of highlighting that this relationship in general has many aspects of this kind of critical point attractor system like precipitation variance peaks at that area where we see the mode of the PDF and, and other characteristics. So um, that would be, I guess, a long way of saying I think it's gonna be really hard to peg down a specific time scale because I think there might not be a specific time or space scale to this that it might be a little bit more ubiquitous. Yeah. Okay, um, I think, oh, okay, let's put it up. Uh, Rosie, uh, can you, I think I, I saw it for just a second, and it was basically how do weather and climate models, yeah, do these cycles, uh, yeah. Um, obviously, to get these cycles well, you need to get two components. Well, you need to get a bunch of things, right? But at the very basic level, um, precipitation has to respond realistically to the thermodynamic environment, and then precipitation has to drive a realistic evolution of the thermodynamic environment. So that's asking a lot out of our, our models, right? Especially considering how complex those feedbacks were. It wasn't just surface fluxes. It wasn't just radiation. It wasn't just transport terms. They all have their special role in this in, in different parts of these cycles. Um, so we, a couple years ago, we looked at kind of a range of the CAM models going all the way back to CAM 3, which um, neglected uh, entrainment in the, the Zhang McFarlane convective scheme. And in there, we saw absolutely no evolution in that phase space because like in, in that scheme, convection really wasn't sensitive to variations in free tropospheric moisture. When you went to CCSM4 and you uh, introduced that um, 
kind of entrainment um, into the, the Zhang McFarland scheme, then we did see some evolution in that phase space. And part of it was correct, and part of it was quite incorrect. Um, so to say that they had some coupling there, and there were aspects of it which looked realistic, and there were aspects that, that didn't look that realistic. Um, kind of the best performance we've seen thus far has been from the super parameterized versions of the CAM. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, and, and we've been starting to look at, at the, the NOAA weather model. But we see a, a whole range of behavior from not very much coupling to actually fairly realistic coupling. Um, but even the ones that seem to get that correct behavior superficially, sometimes you'll see that they're overly dependent on one type of feedback versus another. So when we've uh, more recently have been looking at, um, um, I'm going to blink on it right now. Uh, we've been looking at coupled models, um, and we see that it does get a somewhat realistic evolution there. But when you look at the surface flux feedbacks, they're a little bit out of whack. And so that would uh, imply that your uh, oceanic uh, energy, energy evolution is not Correct either. So there's some. Right, we have one it. more uh, question on the on the screen. Um, oh, Chelsea. Can hey, Chelsea. you comment on uh, this is from Chelsea Nam? Can you comment on the transition between the two cycles of deep wide convection cycle and the alto uh, stratus cycle? Does it involve with uh, tropical extratropical interaction? Why was the difference between period one and two versus periods three and four? In yeah. other words. Yeah, good question. So I'll start with the end of that. Um, I don't know what the difference was between period one and two and versus three and four. Um, but Dynamo offers a great chance to look at that, because not only do we have atmospheric moist static energy budgets, but we've got a whole bunch of ocean data collected from that. So we can look at this from a coupled perspective. It's interesting if you just looked at you know, precipitation that you know, at this point, you wouldn't necessarily have any reason to expect that you were about to enter this long period of suppressed convection. But when you look at it in this phase space, it's clear that something different is, is happening. Um, in terms of the transition between the two, this kind of goes back to some of um, David Neal, or sorry, um, David Raymond's work from 2009. Using those two simple assumptions that I mentioned earlier, if you just assume weak temperature gradient balance um, and you assume some proportionality between moisture variability and precipitation variability, he was able to show in a really simple model that the system uh, should be one where you have two stable equilibriums, one that's relatively highly precipitating, one that's relatively lightly precipitating, and then an unstable equilibrium between the two of them. So you can imagine this as being almost two bowls at a skate park with a little, a little um, spine in between there. Um, and so you know, figuring out exactly what's going on in, in that transition um, area is, is something that I'm very interested in. But I think in terms of the tropical, extratropical interactions, I think any time the system gets near there, it's in a state where it's much more susceptible to some of these forcing-like perturbations, which we could imagine coming from the extratropics of pushing the system into that other cycle or other basin for an extended period of time. Um, so I'm going to ask a, a little bit more of a critical thing. Yeah, uh, for sure. Since you were asking for it in the beginning to be critical. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm wondering if it makes sense to kind of strip the dynamics away completely. Because your, your cloud population, uh, separation of clouds into populations, um, they're kind of agnostic to what, what dynamic features they're associated with. And if you go back to the um, three peaks of the dynamo period, mm -hmm. Sure. Um, especially the middle one, the one that's late November. I remember that pretty well because I was actually in the field. And that very big spike there in green, that's probably Dece uh, November 24th or so. And what happened was there was essentially a, a tropical cyclone-like feature that moved through the domain. OK. So it maybe it makes sense to, to just be agnostic of these things. But if you're looking at the meteorology, they're, they're actually very different. So for that November MGO event, um, I think you, re you refer to it as the double Kelvin waves. Uh, yeah, uh, this one here, I believe, was the maybe the double Kelvin yeah, wave event, so, if I remember right. Was um, that, is that correct, George, the second one? Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, we, well, we, uh, uh, Shui Chen and her group, we're also having a little bit of a different idea of that because 
what we think it was is actually essentially there. The Kelvin wave that we saw was this, you know, when you look at the MGO, you get this kind of um, jellyfish-like behavior with the head moving through, kind of like a Kelvin wave, and there there's gyres well, spun off of the, uh, like a jellyfish. Yep. And so it, when you look at it in Hofmillers and filter for it, it looks like two Kelvin waves. But in, essentially, it's one Kelvin wave that is spawning these gyres. And since it's dragging them along, it looks like two Kelvin waves. So okay. it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, but it's not a duck. Yeah. Um, again, my overall point is, can we bring the dynamics, um, the meteorology, larger scale meteorology into this and learn something? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think, you know, impossible to actually, in the real world, detangle the dynamics from the convection. And, and the best you can do is just to frame your, in this case, we're, we're framing our space that we're looking at fairly agnostically. We're just saying measure of convective instability, precipitation rate are two proxies for environment and convection. Let it go and see what it does, right? That's about the best you can do with it in the real world. Now, idealized modeling setups, you know, that's or something. It, it, it would actually be interesting to look at that, that um, self-aggregation um, simulation of, of Nathan Arnold's because that's the case where you have stripped out all of those really, not all of them, but you've stripped out the rotational dynamics part about that, right? And, and if you pay attention to that simulation, even in those heavily convecting areas and the heavily suppressed areas, you can just see precipitation pulsing in there, right? So there's a whole bunch of variability going in there. So, you know, it's, it's staying near that state of kind of quasi-balance, but it's getting bounced around a, a whole lot. And so that would offer an opportunity to, to do that, to look at it more in the absence of dynamics. But, um, you know, then you're always going to be questioning yourself how real is what you're looking at, you know? So at least as a starting point, and I think those are all valid approaches that we, we really don't understand a lot about this stuff yet. So, you know, more than anything, I hope this work is just a conversation starter that gets people excited to, uh, you know, maybe look at this kind of stuff more and, and dig in a little bit deeper. So, thanks okay, well, thank you very much, Brandon. Thanks.